we're getting straight to the first session, titled Reflections on the Palestinian State. This session takes on an interview format. So please welcome to the stage Palestinian-American writer Susan Abulawa, facilitated by Lubna Nadvi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lubna Nadvi, and it is my pleasure to facilitate this very special session with Susan Abuhawa, author of Mornings in Janine, which is an international bestseller and has been translated into 30 languages. So a very warm welcome to you, Susan, to Durban, and to Thank the you. time of the Writer Festival. Thank you. The format of this session will be as follows. Follows. We will have a 30 to 35 minute uh, interview and conversation, and then we will open up the floor for question and answer. So let me first of all begin by asking you, Susan, about the book, Mornings in Janine, and the inspiration that you had. What was your motivation for writing this book, which many have argued is, has actually filled that gap which existed where the Palestinian voice was missing and now a Palestinian voice has told a very important Palestinian story. So tell us something about that journey of writing this book. Yeah. Um, well, it wasn't just one thing. There were several factors that um, went into this. And what you just mentioned is one of them. Um, the late Edward Said uh, once lamented that um, there was a real need for a Palestinian narrative in Western literature because you know, our story has mostly been told in the West by, um, by the conquerors, essentially. Um, but uh, you know, I, I was uh, trained as a biologist. I went to medical school, and, and so my science, my, um, my background, my educational background was in science. Um, but I started writing political commentary um, at the outbreak of the Second Intifada. It was just born from um, just uh, activism and frustration by, by the incredibly biased uh, media reports in, in the United States especially. Um, so I got hooked in with a lot of activists who were on the ground. And then in 2002, there were reports of a massacre happening in Janine. Of course, Israel, as, as they often do when they commit atrocities, they um, will cordon off uh, the area, call it a closed military zone, um, whereby no one's allowed in or out, no, no reporters, no human rights workers, no NGOs, nobody but the military. And of course, you know, they, they do what they want. Um, but there, there had been reports that a massacre was taking place. And um, I was in the US, uh, completely feeling helpless and impotent and frustrated. And so I decided to go there. <laughs> I had no idea um, why I was going or what I would do when I got there. I just had the sense that I, I needed to be there. So um, I, I took my two weeks vacation that my company allowed me. I was working as a biologist. And um, what I uh, what I witnessed in Janine, and in, in, uh, I was one of the first international observers in the aftermath of that massacre, um, and it, it was something that really sort of changed the course of my life in many ways. Um, you know, being Palestinian, you sort of grow up with stories of various um, massacres, whether it's Kabya, Deir Yassin, Sobran Shatila, you know, the list is quite long. and. You know, we've, we've read about them, we've seen the stories, we've seen the pictures, um, but it was an entirely different experience to see that kind of inhumanity up close and personal and, and, um, and to smell it. Um, there were uh, bulldozers had leveled entire neighborhoods, um, you know, sometimes people still inside, and, and so there were rotting corpses, you could smell them and we couldn't get to them. And so it was two weeks of digging bodies out of the rubble, um, trying to organize activities for kids who were unbearably traumatized. And um, so it was, it was definitely a um, uh, life-changing experience. But the thing that was most humbling to me was to witness the people of Janine and how they dealt with, um, with what they've been going through. Um, there was this unbelievable defiance and resilience that remained um, People just were not broken. Um, the experiences that they that they had relayed to me, I have um, 
tons of hours of interviews with people that I recorded while I was there. Um, their experience was something that would completely break me in, and, but they were just, um, they, they were whole, they remained whole. And the other thing that was um, really a hell of a thing to witness was the kind of love that, that they showed for one another. I mean, they had literally lost everything. There was a, there was a major shortage of water in the camp and there really wasn't anything to drink. Um, certainly in a bathing water, I mean, we all stunk. <laughs> and, um, and, and anytime anyone would get anything, they would just share it with each other and um, everybody was helping everybody. So it was really, it was, it was just, it was, um, I was in awe and it was, uh, I felt really privileged to just observe that, that kind of humanity, especially juxtaposed so closely to such an humanity. Um, so I went back and um, with the sense that I really, I just wanted to tell this story, especially because in the U.S., um, what was being reported were, uh, the, the reports were, were presented in such animalistic terms, like, you know, Janine, a den of terror, or a nest of this, or, or that. I mean, it's just, um, as, as U.S. media reports often are, they're just very dehumanizing to Palestinians, and it's, it's a narrative that blames Palestinians for their own fate um, and, uh, and you know, um, labels us as terrorists or, or anything else. So um, that's, I mean, that, it was born from that. The idea that of including Janine, I wanted to include that experience somehow in the novel. That's an amazingly powerful testimony. And of course, um, the book is evidence of the way you know, those events have moved you. Now, the novel talks about the Abu Heja family and their experiences through four generations. And one of the characters that stands out is Amma and you know, her relationship with her father, Hassan. And the title, Mornings in Janine, seems to be speaking quite to quite a bit of that relationship. Tell us more about what Mornings in Janine really means and that special relationship between Amal and her father. Um, yeah, so, so the title of this novel comes from uh, the relationship uh, between Amal and her father. And Actually, in the opening session, um, I read a, um, an excerpt from, from that. Um, these were, so Amal was, um, uh, Amal was born in the refugee camp of Janine after the family had been driven out in 48 from, from their village of Einhold. And um, she, her father used to read to her at dawn um, before he went to work. He, you know, they, he, was, um, he worked from you know, before the sun came up until, you know, until late at night. So that was the time that she spent with her father um, when he read uh, some of the great Arab and Sufi poets to her. Uh, and it was, um, it was just, it was, it was a special, time in her life that, that she would draw on for the rest of her life. Um, and it also sort of represents the, the essence of the story, even though um, the story is full of war, it's full of pain and sorrow, and, um, and, and it's, uh, I suppose, by the mere fact that it's a Palestinian narrative, it's also political. Um, but to me, as a writer, it, it's a love story. Um, and it's love on many different levels, you know, love between uh, farmers and their land, love between a father and his daughter and um, mother and her children, um, love between a man and a woman, between friends, between siblings. The descriptions that um, you provide of some of the political events are quite, you know, um, intense and quite, um, you know, emotional in fact. Um, this actually speaks to the truth of what has happened and so you've attempted to combine the love story together with the political narrative. Now, clearly this is trying to achieve a very specific purpose which is to talk about this history of the Palestinian people. What do you feel is the role of writers and literature in telling these important political stories in terms of social justice issues? What role do you know, the word artists play in, in doing that? I mean, that's, that's kind of an open-ended question in many ways. I think that, um, you know, writers, what we write in large part is shaped by our societies, and in turn, what we write then um, shapes, shapes our society right back. Um, in, in the case, in my case, um, I, I mentioned earlier that the Palestinian story has mostly been told 
um, by others until recently. So, you know, when Europeans came to Palestine and conquered Palestine um, and turned it into Israel, uh, the, the narrative was that it was a land without a people for a people without a land. And, and this, um, this narrative was reinforced by propaganda novels like Exodus. Um, that uh, uh, you know that perpetuated that idea, and so the reason this narrative is was the predominant one at the time was is, is uh, it's multifold. For one thing, um, it was this perfect romantic ending, happy ending. It was what the West wanted to hear um, and to assuage their guilt for what they had done. Um, but the other reason is that you know our writers. Um, our, our literary traditions were primar primar primarily in Arabic um, and in and, and, and the form of poetry, um, which wasn't really accessible to the West. And uh, in any event, they weren't really interested in our narrative. So, um, so in the time between um, 1948 and, and the 60s, the mid-60s, um, the Palestinians had been going from one court to another, one country to another, pleading, begging, you know, how long do we have to wait, when are we going to go home? And, and it wasn't until Palestinians started hijacking planes that that narrative was deconstructed. And the world was like, oh wait, yeah, I guess Palestinians do exist. Um, but um, while, uh, while, while um, armed struggle at that time did manage to change the narrative, um, Palestinians still did, did not control uh, you know, their own uh, their own story in the West. Um, so then the narrative shifted um, to, okay, they're, uh, you know, they exist, but they're terrorists, they're crazy, they're irrational, they just want to kill us, and they're just you know, waiting to eat us. And, um, so, but what's happened um, since then is that uh, generations of us now have grown up in the diaspora, having been dispossessed and disinherited. Um, some of us uh, grown up in the West, we speak Western languages and we're able to communicate in the nuances of Western culture. So what's happened now is that there is this, um, there's a crop of new writers um, um, and, and artists and filmmakers and musicians that are confronting the West with our humanity. Um, and that is sort of deconstructing that old narrative. Um, so the reaction <laughs> from, from those who want to perpetuate uh, you know, a narrative that um, that provides for uh, the propagation of this um, process of ethnic cleansing of Palestinians um, have sort of countered this narrative um, with something that along the lines of, well, um, if they if they if the two sides could just get together and, um, and and stop hating each other and just talk, then everything will be all right. So, in this narrative. Um, you know what's created is, is this, this, this image of, of parity, as if these are just two equal sides who disagree on a matter and just need to just sit down and talk it out, rather than the reality of you know a nuclear power that's pitted against um, a principally unarmed, defenseless population, um, and that is inflicting on them the most savage violence on a daily basis. Um, and so in this in this sort of counter narrative, there is you know they they will mention that. Well, there are problems, you know, Israel's not perfect. Um, and sort of minimize, you know, these atrocities as, you know, problems or issues. Um, so as a Palestinian writer, um, presenting our story, our narrative, in, a, in an authentic Palestinian voice um, is a form of resistance as far as I'm concerned. And, and um, uh, you know, and... and, and I hope it's um, it's an effective piece of the whole that uh, that does challenge these old, damaging, dangerous, and hurtful narratives. I think that one of the things about any novel is the impact that it has on the reader, and you know how we, as the reader, you write for an audience, and of course the reader responds to it in certain ways. When I read it, it was you know I had to sort of um, put it down and just reflect on what had just been said. It was powerful, and as an activist, you know, I could uh, really identify with it. Please do share with us some of the responses that your readers have had, and you know, the letters you've received, mm -hmm. and people coming up to you. What, what has that been like for, for the reading audience? 
Um, surprisingly, actually, it, they've all been positive. I think out of hundreds, I've had maybe like one or two, you know, nasty letters. Um, I was really surprised by that because I actually get like tons of nasty letters when I write political commentary in newspapers and stuff. Um, but for the most part, they've been, um, so there's, there's this theme that runs across all of them and it's basically that um, it's either, wow, I never knew or I always had a, an inkling that something wasn't right, but I understand, I think I, I, I get it now. Um, I've gotten letters from American Jews who've said, you know, um, I, I really had no idea, I mean, that kind of language. Um, I even got letters from uh, Palestinian, young Palestinians who have grown up in the diaspora um, to, to parents who were born to parents who were expelled in 1948. And um, I remember this one particular letter, it was really quite touching. Um, uh, the girl said to me that, you know, I think, you know, I grew up with all this and I felt pretty knowledgeable most of my life about this conflict, but it really took your book to help me really understand my father. And, um, and apparently the book had sort of brought the family uh, to a new level of understanding or something. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been a privilege to, uh, to be able to be invited into people's hearts in that way. No, that's, that's absolutely profound. And, um, you know, the South African audience has certainly, from, you know, the conversations we've had really taken to this book, it has produced, uh, for example, a very powerful CD by a group called Mavericks yeah. um, and called Palestine is a New Black. So obviously it has had that amazing impact and, um, you know, well done and congratulations to you for having achieved that um, with this important book. Now, 2013 is the 65th year of the Nakba, and the, the Nakba is something that is a very um, significant event, uh, or the commemoration of it uh, in the Palestinian history. What are your thoughts on that, and perhaps you'd like to share something from the book around sure, that? Yeah. Thanks for letting me borrow your for you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the Nakba is the, um, uh, is what we call um, our dispossession when Israel uh, kicked us all out, basically, um, through various means, um, massacres, terror, um, just driving people out, spreading rumors that, you know, if we, if you don't leave, we're going to um, do what we did to people in Dalia Yassin. It's a very famous massacre um, in Jerusalem. And to this day, those people um, and their descendants languish in refugee camps. Um, in the meantime, uh, Jews from all over the world are still pouring into Palestine, um, uh, to, taking our place, basically. So um, it's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the oldest script in the book, really. Um, uh, it's, it's a colonial imperialist project in which um, a group of Europeans, um, privileged white men, decided that they were entitled to to this piece of land um, and proceeded to invoke God in order to take it. Um, and 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 you know to this day it's it's ongoing. Um, okay, so I will. Um, there's a <clears throat> there's a part in the book that sort of discusses um, the this one family's experience during the Nakba. Um, so the, just to set it up, um, the family has already uh, been moved out, and they're sort of all huddled, and um, and they're just they're just being pushed out. Um, the um, one, the youngest son. Uh, this is sort of a t a tangent in the in the narrative of this book. So one of the sons is um, grows up as an Israeli Jew and finds, uh, he and his brother find themselves on opposite sides of the war, and this sort of depicts how that happened. Panic rose from the shots, and the birds of terror were supplanted by clouds that made Yahya hope for rain. It wasn't the season yet, but his trees needed water. At times, rain had been everything in Einholt. Other times, it was merely precious. Then he saw his son Darwish, and nothing had meaning rain be damned. Yehe dropped the basket from his back and began to cry for that strong boy of his, that impressive rider and beloved son. Dalia still hadn't caught up. The panic throngs had separated her from Hassan, but she could still see the top of his kafiya ahead of her. He was taller than most men. She'd always liked that. 
God, what's happening? The clouds passed as suddenly as they came. The sun stung like a scorpion. Dust was high, cactus low, and Dahlia thought of water. In an instant, one instant, six-month-old Ismail was at her chest in her motherly arms. In the next, Ismail was gone. An instant can crush your brain and change the course of life, the course of history. It was an infinitesimal flash of time that Dahlia would revisit in her mind over and over for many years, searching for some clue, some hint of what might have happened to her son. Even after she became lost in an eclipsed reality, she would search the fleeing crowds in her mind for Ismail. Ibni, Ibni, my son, my son, Dahlia screamed, her eyes bulging in search of her son, dust at her face, cactus at her feet. Ibni, Ibni, she scanned the ground, looked up, and Hassan's tall figure was not there. Ibni, Ibni, some people tried to help her, but gunshots told, and Dahlia was shoved along. Is this a dream? Nothing seemed real because it was unbelievable. She looked at her arms again to be sure. Maybe he's crawled into my thobe. She felt her chest. There was no Ismail. Her son was gone. Dahlia stopped, and so did time. She screamed like she hadn't when her father burned her hand. A loud, penetrating, consuming, unworldly scream from a mother's deepest agony from the most profound desire to reverse time, just a few minutes. Hassan ran to her and searched the crowd as desperately as Dahlia had. Afraid for his older child, Hassan held Yusuf close as he looked for Ismail. Yusuf squeezed his father tighter, afraid to speak, and the three of them, at last, made it to safety on Hassan's strength and will, but without Ismail. The villagers sat on the ground in the valley, the land was as beautiful and peaceful as it had always been. Trees and sky and hills and stone were unchanged, and the villagers were dazed and quiet, except Dahlia. She was mad with anguish, questioning people and uncovering other women's babies in hope of revealing a boy with a scar down his right cheek, around his eye. She searched with frenzied foreboding, even though Yehya tried to reassure her that surely someone had picked up the child and surely it would only be a matter of time before they would be reunited. Surely, Yahya knew, you can't hold on to words. Dahlia spent the last of her energy on tears, replaying that instant over and over. Little, little Yusuf, not comprehending the sudden hell that had befallen the whole village, agreed to let go of his father and sat in his jiddo Yahya's arms, both of them dazed and teary. Hassan shuffled restlessly between his wounded brother, Darwish, his inconsolable wife, his terrified son, and his bewildered father, until finally he, he succumbed to exhaustion and slept on the ground among merciless mosquitoes, a stone to rest his head. But not even sleep could assuage the inadequacy he had felt. He had failed to protect his family. He could not provide assurance, nor could he bring Ismail back. Jiddo? Can we go home now? Yusuf asked his grandfather. Yahya could not lie, nor could he tell the truth. He kissed his grandson, pulled him closer, tighter to his chest, and said, Get some rest, Ya Ibni. Get some rest now, Ya Habibi. My son, my beloved. They tried to go back the next day, but the guns behind them forbade a return home. For three days and two nights, they made their way up and down unforgiving hills, under the sun's glare and unseen but sure watch of snipers. A diabetic boy and his grandmother fell and died. One woman miscarried, and the dehydrated bodies of two babies went limp in their mother's arms. Janine was as far as they could go, and they rested wherever there was space among the flood of refugees converging from other villages. Residents of those towns helped them as much as they could, giving away their food, blankets, and water, and fitting as many as possible into their homes in that time of crisis. Soon, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, gave out a few tents and a refugee camp sprang up in Janine, where the villagers of Ain Hald could stand on the hills and look back at the homes to which they could never return. So it was that eight centuries after its founding by a general of Salah ad dins army in 1189 AD, Ain Hald was cleared of its Palestinian children. Yahya tried to calculate the number of generations who had lived and died in that village, and he came up with 40. 
It was a task made simple by the way Arabs name their children to tell a story of their genealogy, conferring five or six names from the child's direct lineage and in proper order. Thus, Yahya tallied 40 generations of living, now stolen. 40 generations of childbirth and funerals, weddings, dance, prayer, and scraped knees. 40 generations of sin and charity, of cooking, toiling, and idling, of friendships and animosities and pacts, of rain and lovemaking. 40 generations with their imprinted memories, secrets, and scandals, all carried away by the notion of entitlement of another people who would settle in the vacancy and proclaim it all, all that was left in the way of architecture, orchards, wells, flowers, and charm, as the heritage of Jewish foreigners arriving from Europe, Russia, the United States, and other corners of the globe. Thank you very much. Now that... um, section of the book that you've read speaks to the issue of the Palestinian struggle, the root and, and how much of this um, struggle has you know, started. Um, in terms of the struggle itself and where it is right now, if you look at the issue of Palestinian leadership and where Palestinians are located, I mean, they're obviously all over the Fragments, place in terms yeah. of you know the, the geographical location. How would you describe and, and how would you sort of respond to the issue of um, you know how are Palestinians relating to to this issue in terms of the struggle itself, the leadership? Is there Palestinian leadership? Uh, is there unity amongst the Palestinians? What is the status of the struggle from from that perspective? Well, we definitely don't have our act together, as you've noticed. Um, one, of the, one of the main issues is, is a geographic fragmentation. So, um, you know, Israel's been uh, brilliant at, at dividing Palestinians um, in, in so many ways. So, first you have those who live under occupation. You've got those in Gaza who are completely separated from Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, and then who are completely cut off from Jerusalem um, and, and separated from those in Jerusalem. And even those in the West Bank then are living in Bantustans um, that are uh, essentially make up less than 8% um, of our historic homeland. Um, and these, these, uh, these isolated Bantustans are completely surrounded by Jewish-only settlements um, that, and then, uh, that are also bisected by Jewish-only roads. You can only, you, Palestinians are not allowed on these roads. In, and um, only Jews are allowed to live in, in these settlements. So, um, and then to get from one Palestinian town to another, you have to go through multiple checkpoints. Um, uh, you really just, and you have to have a permit too. I mean, it's a whole this, it's a whole labyrinth of military orders and legal decrees that um, that essentially completely isolate Palestinians and and and, uh, uh, and prevent sort of you know movement. So those are the Palestinians under occupation. Then you have Palestinians who live in refugee camps um, in various Arab states who, who face different kinds of challenges, um, including you know, disenfranchisement and poverty and, and so forth. And then there are Palestinians um, in 1948. So uh, the, these Palestinians um, who, who did not flee became Israeli citizens after 1948. Um, and they had every they had all their property seized. They lived under military rule for uh, f- for I think it was like 16 years or something, and um, uh, but they but they live as you know fifth class citizens within Israel, and they have their their own challenges. And then there are Palestinians who live in the diaspora, like myself, who um, uh, who again have uh, also our own our own challenges. Um, so there's this geographic fragmentation that has that has produced um, political fragmentation, psychological, social fragmentation as well. Um, and, and on top of everything, you know, we had a revolutionary movement that uh, suddenly became turned into uh, uh, a, a group of bureaucrats and politicians called the Palestinian Authority. And, um, but the one thing that um, we all agree on, the one, the one thread that, um, that, that unites us all is that um, uh, we, our struggle is, is a national liberation struggle. It's one, uh, uh, it's, it's one for freedom and for human rights. And 
Um, there's no disagreement on that. And as um, based on that, the Palestinian civil society um, representing uh, hundreds of NGOs um, from, from the refugee population from inside Palestine, women's organizations, labor unions, etc., um, have uh, issued a call for uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel um, to isolate it um, in the same way that um, the apartheid government was isolated um, through international sanctions and pressure. Now, in terms of the solutions, obviously we have been able to identify the, the problems and the, the challenges. How would you uh, respond to the issue of what are the solutions in terms of what are the absolute non-negotiable um, you know, conditions that need to come about in order for a final status a resolution on, on Palestine? Mm -hmm. and, and many people have engaged this question. If the Palestinian leadership is, <coughs> is struggling, um, you know, what do Palestinians themselves want? Uh, well, I mean, the, there's always been a solution. The solution is quite clear. It's, it's the political will to implement it. And essentially it is that, you know, we are the indigenous population of that land. I mean, we, we, we have always been there. We didn't step off of European boats and proceed to kill and terrorize everybody in sight and then steal everything that they had. Um, we were already there. We have always been there. We are the indigenous population in every sense of that word, culturally, genetically, historically, legally, um, and we have a right to live there. It's that simple. And and um, no one has, we have a right to live without foreign masters too. Uh, I think, you know, a situation that respects this, that respects, that's based on universal human dignity um, and equality under the law is is the solution. I mean, there has to be a framework that um, that does not that does not accord privilege and entitlement to one group of people based on their religion, which is the situation right now, and which is not unlike apartheid here, where you know people were accorded privilege and entitlement because of their skin color. Um, so, you know, the solution is quite clear. The problem is, um, you know, international will to implement this. I mean, there are tons. Um, hundreds of UN resolutions condemning Israel and calling on it to um, respect international law and, and various um, tenets of, of international norms. Um, but, uh, you know, Israel has been held above the law. They've been able to commit war crimes with impunity. Um, and which is the reason why, you know, the, the BDS call was issued because, um, you know, a lot of Palestinians see this as. Uh, you know, really our only hope and is, is to garner grassroots um, global solidarity. In terms of um, the question of apartheid, we South Africans identify very closely with the Palestinian struggle, having <coughs> gone through apartheid ourselves. How would you um, characterize, or what is the, the way in which South Africans can actually make a difference? What is particular or specific that South African activists or the South African Solidarity Movement can do to actually uh, make a difference to the Palestinian struggle and contribute to it substantially. We know that there's a degree of complicity by the South African government um, towards you know, the sustaining the occupation. So what can we as South African civil society do to really make a difference? Well, the whole idea of, of boycott sanctions and, um, and divestment, no BDS, is um, is for uh, is for civil society internationally to to act um, to pressure their governments, their universities, um, their organizations to uh, to stop doing business as usual um, with this racist state, um, thereby just prolonging uh, prolonging this apartheid regime and, and also lending credibility to it. Um, you know, South Africa, even though I think, uh, at least, you know, what I've seen, what I've felt is that there is a um, sort of a natural, visceral even, uh, comprehension of, of this conflict, more than I've seen in other places where I've given talks, and, and I've really kind of been around the world just, you know, talking on this issue. Um, so there is this visceral comprehension, and there is, there is a real solidarity, I think, among people. Um, but... Uh, but, at the, but at the same time, um, South Africa, for example, 
um, contributes about $1 billion a year to the Israeli economy mm -hmm. um, that perpetuates this um, racism just through the diamond industry alone. Um, and, and actually this year, uh, South Africa is chairing the Kimberley process, which is um, it's a sort of a, a committee set up to um, uh, to to sort of monitor blood diamonds and so forth. And and as the chair this year, South Africa is in a in a position to um, to expand the definition of, of blood diamonds. Currently, it just I think it just includes um, like rebel groups. Um, but you know, I, if that definition is expanded to include um, states who are engaged in systematic abuse uh, of, of uh, you know of another people, then um, that you know that could you know remedy uh, quite a lot actually. Well, that's a very important point that you make, and I think that that is the next step for us as solidarity activists to 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 take on that particular task. Now, late last year, the UN gave uh, Palestine a particular status, you know, some kind of statehood. Um, what is your response to that? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? What substantive meaning does that actually have? Um, you know, the, 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 the only benefit, the only real benefit that I can, uh, practical benefit that I can see from, from this move is that it would give Palestinians access to the ICC. Um, Short of, of Palestinians actually going to the ICC and, and, um, and starting a process of trying to prosecute people for war crimes um, that they have committed and, um, uh, and, and to seek some, some kind of restorative justice through the ICC. Um, I mean, that's, that's as far as I can see the only benefit. But short of actually exercising that access, I don't think it's really meaningful at all, actually. <coughs> And that's important coming from someone who is, you know, Palestinian and, and understands that context. There's a large number of Palestinians who are living outside of Palestine in the diaspora, and they are obviously having a very important, they do have an important role to play in, you know, sort of drawing attention to what is happening back in their homeland. What do you think about this diasporic community? Is it making an impact? In what ways? Uh, is it making that contribution to the Palestinian struggle? Um, well, it's not just the diaspora. I mean, even you know, Palestinians on the ground. There are you know, this um, everybody. I think all Palestinians, in their capacity, sort of contribute to the struggle in one way or another. Um, like I said, you know, those of us in the diaspora are uh, at least you know, artists and, and um, writers and so forth are sort of shift trying to shift the discourse. Um, and to you know something resembling the truth a little, um, but you know w within the within the West Bank, for example, uh, you know there there, there there have been mass hunger strikes. Um, there's a man named Samar Isawi who has been on a hunger strike for um, as of today 241 days. Um, he has I think he's nearly lost his sight. Um, he probably he has irreparable, irreversible damage to a lot of his organs. He's still surviving and. Um, he was offered a uh, a deal um, in which you know for his release, in which but he would have to be deported from his um, ancestral home in East Jerusalem to Gaza, which is something Israel does quite a bit. And um, and he refused. He said, you know, I'd rather die. We are, you know, we're fighting for um, for the rights of Palestinian refugees, not to not to add to their numbers. So it's these, even though you know these um, heroic acts and and um, and constant atrocities don't really reach um, mainstream audiences, they are reaching people, and it's harder for Israel to sort of hide these realities, especially with the ease of access of information through through the internet. Um, and so, so what's happened is that um, there is there is a shift in awareness, it's, and it's palpable actually, you know. Like ten years ago, um, you I would have never seen the kind of criticism that is sort of creeping into um, mainstream media now, because it just it's something that can't be ignored. Like for example, um, UNICEF uh, last week issued a report um, on on the uh, condition of children. Israel um, regularly arrests children in their homes. Usually um, between the hours of 5 a.m., uh, between midnight and 5 a.m., they're, they're dragged from their beds. Um, most of them, you know, piss and shit their pants on the way. 
it's it's horrendous and and they are you know they're they're tortured in Israeli jails they're put in, in solitary confinement they're denied access to their parents so UNICEF just came out with this really damning um, uh, report in which they um, they described and I quote um, systematic um, institutionalized abuse of children so you know these so so yeah. You know, um, U.S. Even though U.S. media reports will spin it, um, you know they, they can't ignore it anymore because what happens is you know activists get hold of these and they tweet it and they Facebook it and it's and it's constant and it's in their face and it can't be ignored. So so the, so the discourse is shifting, awareness is shifting, and I think the solidarity movement is growing. You mentioned there um, the impact of what's happening in Palestine on children, and I'd like to. Um, perhaps conclude this interview session by asking you about the youth of Palestine, Palestinian youth. Um, what are their prospects? What hope do they have? How are they responding to some of these challenges that they face? And perhaps there's a passage in your book that sheds some light on that or gives some hope to the future generation uh, of Palestinians. Hmm, I don't know what passage, but um, yeah, Palestinian, I mean, it's it's uh, they're, they're definitely traumatized. I mean, like in Gaza, for example, 98.6% 98, of Palestinian children um, exhibit symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but at the same time, they're also quite resilient. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 it's going to take generations. Even, even if this conflict were to end tomorrow, um, it will be many, many years before these, these wounds can heal. Uh, because they are quite profound, um, and it, you know, Palestinians are are an abused, violated, and humiliated society across the board. Um, and exasperating that condition is the fact that um, Palestinians are actually blamed for their own fate. And um, you know, I mean, it's, it's unprecedented that the world has ever demanded that a, a, an oppressed people actually sit down and negotiate with their oppressors. Um, for freedom and for for human rights, and and yet that's that's precisely what um, what we are asked to do. Um, all right, so I, I do have another passage I can read if you want me to read. So it's just like one short paragraph. Um, I'm reading it because a lot of Palestinians told me that they love this paragraph, and um, it's just so Amal uh, is leaving her. Um, She's leaving the refugee camp, and she's going to go into an orphanage in Jerusalem. And um, so she's, she's on her way to the orphanage, and then um, Jack O'Malley, who's the head of the UN agency, stops, and she's sort of overlooking Jerusalem, and these are her thoughts. <clears throat> I've always found it difficult not to be moved by Jerusalem, even when I hated it, and God knows I've hated it for the sheer human cost of it. But the sight of it, from afar or inside the labyrinth of its walls, softens me. Every inch of it holds the confidence of ancient civilizations. Their deaths and their birthmarks press deep into the city's viscera and onto the rubble of its edges. The deified and the condemned have set their footprints in its sand. It has, con it has been conquered, raised, and rebuilt so many times that its stones seem to possess life bestowed by the audit trail of prayer and blood. Yet somehow it exhales humility. It sparks an inherent sense of familiarity in me, that doubtless irrefutable Palestinian certainty that I belong to this land. It possesses me, no matter who conquers it, because its soil is the keeper of my roots, of the bones of my ancestors, because it knows the private lust that flamed the beds of all my foremothers because I am the natural seed of its passionate, tempestuous past. I am a daughter of the land, and Jerusalem reassures me of this inalienable title, far more than the yellowed property deeds, the Ottoman land registries, the iron keys to our stolen homes, or the UN resolutions and decrees of superpowers could ever do. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for those thoughts and those words that you've shared with us. We have just over 15 minutes for questions.
question and answer. And I'd like to now open up the floor for feedback, questions, comments. Um, I have all these lights glaring at me, so I'm not able to see very clearly. But please put up your hand if you'd like to ask a question, and I will note you and then um, give you the floor. So may I take uh, the gentleman there? Then there's a lady in red here, and then in the front there's a gentleman. There's three hands there. So shall we just start with the side? Yes, sir. Uh, just curious about a number of things, but. I'd like to get the, the author's views. Uh, she's a Palestinian American, and uh, the USA is the number one ally and uh, lapdog of uh, the Zionist apartheid state of Israel. Uh, I wonder what it what it's like to be uh, an, 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 an Palestinian American. Also. Uh, diasporic uh, Palestinians, particularly those in Western Europe, because together with America, Western Europe also uh, is a great ally of, of uh, you know, the, the apartheid state, whether through the, you know, the military industrial complex. Uh, my second question uh, is uh, Israeli uh, Jews who claim to be anti-Zionism, uh, but not unlike white liberals in South Africa during apartheid, seem to continue uh, election after election to vote back the very uh, same Zionists into power uh, in Israel. We, we had a similar situation in South Africa that Steve Beagle in particular went on out to condemn, to say, you know, you white liberals are coming to pat us on the back, you know, but you continue to benefit, happily benefit from the apartheid regime. And not only that, you keep it in power, you vote it back election after election. Curious, what is the writer's attitude towards these Israeli Jews who seek to absolve themselves from the atrocities that are being continuously condemned, uh, uh, committed by, by, by Zionists? Thank you very much. May I request that the questions are short and precise. We want to give many people an opportunity. Shall we take one at a time? And sure. Yeah. So, so the first question about you know what it's like to be Palestinian living in, in the United States. Um, you know, there one of the things that um, those of us in the diaspora face is um, you know you're always sort of at the mercy of your host and. Um, you know, and, and, and you, 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 I, like, I, let me just speak for myself. I want to go back. Um, I'm not allowed, of course. I have, you know, my family is rooted over 950 years in this one small village in East Jerusalem. Um, and prior to that, um, there, there's history in, in the village west of Jerusalem. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't go back for the simple fact that, that I'm not Jewish. That's, that's the only reason. I have a neighbor um, who, who is Jewish. Um, and her daughter, a couple of years ago, was able to go instead and, uh, and reclaim uh, my history and, and become a citizen there. So Israel is, is uh, you know, kind of a, a, a summer country for, uh, for Jews of the world. And um, uh, so it's this, you know, so you live with this, and, and, um, and it's, it's hard to reconcile. I pay taxes in the United States, and it's, my tax dollars are, are funding for this. Um, where do I go? Um, is, so it's it's a constant, um, and, and you know your children grow up. Uh, my child, my daughter, grows up and grew up in the United States. She considers that her country, and and, um, and uh, you know my home is wherever she is, and so I'm sort of tied there. Um, and uh, you know when something like 9/11 happens, though, um, you are your number one suspect. Suspect. Um, so you, you live with that. Like I said, you're always at the mercy of your host. It's, it's a lot harder for um, Arab men, of course, especially if they're Muslim, especially if they have an accent. Um, but you know, you sort of you always live with the indignity of not having a home, and um, and it's quite profound. Um, as far as um, anti-Zionists, um, the true anti-Zionists um, are actually it's a very very small group. Um, in terms of law, as far as Israel is, is concerned. Um, and I, I think I'm, I'm 
good friends with all three of them. <laughs> uh, they are um, they are genuine. Um, I consider them uh, good friends, and um, they are have been calling actually for the dismantlement of, of the entire Zionist infrastructure. Um, they're beautiful people, and I love them dearly. The um, however, what you're talking about is the Israeli left, yeah. um, which, uh, you know, everybody sort of, they call them, you know, the, the peace camp. Um, but it's not really a peace camp. Um, it's exactly what, what you said. I mean, they continue to live there, and, 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 and it's not just that they, they continue to benefit from, uh, from the privileges of, of being Jewish, but um, a, a lot of them actually are, uh, are there um, uh, through Aliyah. Like I'm, you know, I wrote this long article about, the, about this one guy, specifically who's from Missouri, um, and he, you know, sees like his leader in, in the peace camp. But ultimately, they're Zionists. So the, the premise is, you know, they still think Israel should remain a racist Jewish state uh, that accords privilege and entitlement to Jews, but they just think that they should be a little bit nicer to the Palestinians because they're uncomfortable with, you know, seeing images of, of kids. I mean, that's that 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 is the essence of the Israeli peace. Yeah, so maybe here. Um, Susan, I'd like to know if you followed any hope for Barack Obama's visits to Israel. No. Like, uh, <laughs> not at all. And, and you know, the truth is, I really don't. I don't have a lot of faith or confidence in any world leaders. Um, I, uh, I don't think. At least I, I have not seen anyone really choose a moral path in in this instance. Uh, I've not really seen a true leader. Um, who, who's willing to, to say, look, it's, it's not okay to judge the worth of a human being by their religion any more than it's okay to judge the worth of a human being by, by, their, by their skin color. Um, you know, those kinds of leaders, just they're, they're nowhere to be found, neither on the Israeli side, the Palestinian side, or, or certainly not, not the Americans. Um, a lot of us maybe were fooled by Obama's skin color, but that he disabused us of, of any hope we might have had pretty quickly when he was in office. Right. There were three hands here. May I start with the gentleman on the extreme right? Yes. Thank you. My name is Pezu. Uh, I just have one question. Um, at some point, the Palestinians, out of the blue, just decide to put in Hamas. Um, what happened there? I just, um, I, you know, in, in, I got the sense that they did the, 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 the correct thing. But but is is Hamas as a party is 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 it is it making any progress or is the the the, the, the Israelis are becoming even more hostile than ever? Well, let me first say that Hamas is actually uh, a, was is a movement that was actually created by Israel. Um, it was it was even funded by Israel as, as a party to counter Fatah um, early on. So I just want to put that out there. So what happened after the Oslo agreements? Um, you know, after uh, this revolutionary movement suddenly became something called the Palestinian Authority, um, a corruption ensued. You know, once once these guys turn into bureaucrats and, and politicians, I don't know what it is. You know, they just they start. Um, it's all about the. I don't know. They they get corrupted, and and people Palestinian people were fed up with that. They continued. I mean, Oslo was supposed to bring a period of um, uh, of you know. They were supposed to be dismantling settlements. Instead, there was a four-fold increase in, in confiscation of private Palestinian property um, in order to build Jewish-only settlements on that land. So Palestinians were increasingly becoming disillusioned with that, put together with you know seeing um, the the level of corruption within the Palestinian Authority, and um, there were you know Israel was was increasing its crimes against them, and, and so that that pain becomes radicalized and. Um, and, and turns, it, it, you know, Hamas offered an alternative, um, and that's what they went for. They weren't turning, they weren't turning to religion, they weren't, they, it wasn't because it was an Islamist movement, it was because Hamas was, um, seemed like they were transparent, that they were scrupulous, they were, uh, they were instituting a lot of social services for orphans, for widows, um, and, and that's, that's, that's why people turned to them, they wanted an alternative. Um, but you know, it's uh, it basically. I mean, it, it, you know, Israel always finds an excuse. There's always, you know, they never have a partner on the other side. It was Arafat before, and then you know, it's because of Hamas, and 
It's because, never mind the fact that they keep electing one war criminal after another, and we have to talk to them. But, you know, it's just, it's just, Israel has used this whole peace process to basically buy time to continue to colonize the West Bank. And, and all you have to do is look at the maps to see the proof of that. Palestine is quite literally being wiped off the map. Thank you. We have five more minutes, so may I request that we keep it short. Thank you. No, I'll keep it short now. Thank you. My name is Molaw Diskaki. No, I, I, I hear your, your, actually what your book is about contesting the narrative discourse of the Palestinian struggle. Uh, given the problematic narratives that were dominant. Now, I just want to ask you a question as to what form of a social and political praxis should accompany such a progressive narrative that you've given us? That is the first question. My last question is... Okay, I'm sorry, can you, can you just repeat that last part? Sorry. Okay. <coughs> I, 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 I'm saying I, my, the way I understand your work, it's, it's actually contesting the narrative discourse of the Palestinian struggle. Now, 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 seemingly, what you have been talking about is a progressive narrative written by a Palestinian a, a, a citizen. Now, what I want to ask you is, what form of political action should, should accompany such a progressive, such a, a progressive narrative? That is my question. Then, okay. the last question is a, 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 it's about. A, no, let me stop on that one question. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I want to be clear so, uh, about something with this novel. Um, this novel is a work of historic fiction, and and um, while I absolutely did start out with a political aim, um, when I once I started writing this novel, and once the characters um, became real, um, I fell in love with the characters, um, and my aim really was it was no longer political at all. Um, my aim was simply to tell the story of these characters with honesty and with humanity. Um, it was also very important to me to, uh, to be historically accurate and factual, um, and hence you know, a lot of research went into it as well. Um, so, you know, while, like I said, while this, this book sort of does, it does challenge the pervading um, narrative that basically has us as being, you know, these crazy animals, basically just being irrational. Um, because, it, because it's a human story, because it's a love story. Um, so in itself, um, I think it's, it presents a political action. Um, it doesn't need to, I don't feel like it needs to be accompanied by, um, you know, I, I don't think it needs, I think, I think there's already political action. There's, there's solidarity that's happening. Um, there are, uh, you know, people who, um, who are pushing forth Palestinian culture and this sort of cultural intifada. So I, don't know, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. And the last question there. Thank you. Uh, Susan, um, what chance do the Palestinians have uh, when you consider that 90% of the media and the press in America is uh, run by Jews? And, the, and I would say as well probably a great number of, of media as well run by Zionists and the American administration as well is infiltrated by Zionists. Um, yeah, I'm glad you, you corrected the uh, Jewish Zionist thing. Um, because I, you know, Israel kind of wants this to be a religious, um, they want to present it like it's a religious conflict. But the truth is Palestine had historically, prior to the establishment of Israel, had been a multi-religious, multicultural, multi-ethnic society. Um, that included Palestinian Christians, Muslims, and Jews. So I consider that you know Jews are a big part of Palestinian history, not just Palestinian history, but but history of the Middle East. Um, it's just that it didn't include these Europeans who came um, and 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 established the state of Israel. Um, but um, you know, as far as what hope do I see? You know, sometimes I feel like um, some of that. I'll admit. I mean, I get demoralized and I get depressed and. Um, and then I cry about it. But other times I feel really empowered because I do, um, I do see a change and, and I, I do try to focus on that and I, I see the growing solidarity, I see the, you know, um, the change in discourse. Um, and and I, you know, I, I, I put a lot of faith in that because 
history has shown repeatedly through various examples and other times, other places, other people, that this kind of, the kind of regimes that, um, uh, that, that accord exclusivity and entitlement to a group of people that comes at the direct detriment of another people generally don't survive. Um, and so, you know, I, I, and I feel like, you know, this is, um, we have history on our side, we have the truth on our side, we have um, ideals of universal human dignity on our side, we have international law on our side. So um, I don't think that we are powerless um, by any means, and, and I think that um, uh, I, I do see hope. I do, I, I do see hope, especially um, with the a construct of a single state um, in which a legal system does not discriminate among people based on their religion. That is a wonderful note to end the session on. So I want to thank you so much for sharing this time with us, thank for you, your Luna. book, for your participation, and for just being you. It's been wonderful to get to know you. And I wish you very, um, uh, every success in you know, your future endeavors. Um, and uh, go well, as we say in South Africa. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, you will have the opportunity to obviously engage with her in the foyer and get your book signed, but of course buy the book first. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's an awesome read, and uh, I recommend it highly. So if not for yourself, then for a friend, a relative, a gift, but buy it for yourself most importantly. Thank you once again, Susan. Thank you to the audience, and I now conclude the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>